Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Ruben Brigady, and I am the Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. I am also an adjunct senior fellow for African peace and security issues here at the Council on Foreign Relations. I will be presiding over today's discussions. Welcome, all of you, to the Council. May I remind you of two brief administrative notes. First, please note that this meeting is on the record. Second, I remind you to please silence all electronic devices. We will proceed today first with remarks by our guest of honor, and then we will move to a moderated question and answer period. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a warm welcome to the President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, His Excellency Felix Tshishikedi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone. As I stand here before you today, and I arrived here in the United States, and I've come here to talk about my country, the Democratic Republic of Con Congo, the DRC. I've been told that this room has a number of specialist experts on the DRC, and I'm very happy to see that, because now I see that I will be speaking, discussing with people with whom I will not have to provide a lot of explanation and who know our country and will understand us well. I would like to, uh, uh, I would like to say that I hope we will all have a wonderful discussion here this afternoon, and I would like to thank the organizers of the event who have once again given me the opportunity to speak on behalf of my country. For a few months, uh, a few months ago, if I had come here to speak before you, I might have painted a more somber picture of the situation in my country. And I think that we were really in a very difficult situation at that time, and I think you would have agreed with me. I would have also told you that we feared that our country would fall into a situation of violence and a bloodbath. All the indicators were on red. And everything was pointing to the fact that our country risked falling into violence. However, what happened on December 30th, 2018, not only for those who, like me, uh, believe that a miracle took place, but also it was a historic moment. Because this was an event that took place and allowed us to have a change of power that was done in a peaceful way and something that is also quite rare in Africa. It allowed us to bring in a, an opponent from the opposition party, somebody who moreover came from a party that was radically opposed to the uh, president in power. So this was a historic moment. Since this time, we have struck a balance. Of course, it is still fragile, but we still have, ma have managed to strike a balance, a balance that we need to continue to encourage, and that is why I am here. I am here to ask our traditional partners, the partners of the DRC, uh, including the United States, 
to help us and continue to support us so that we can make sure that this fragile equilibrium becomes more solid and allows the Democratic Republic of Congo to finally become a democratic republic and to become a democracy. and to make the transition from the time where we had single party rule and where the deputies have taken many risks, sometimes even at the peril of their own lives, to help overthrow the dictatorial regime at the time and to obtain in our country the foundation with a rule of law and democracy. I believe that today, without any pretension whatsoever, My election has given us the opportunity to finally put into place the dream of our founding fathers, which was to see a country of democracy and to see democracy fully in, in, in implemented in our country. It's been a, a little over two months since I was sworn in as president of the DRC. And I wanted to mark this uh, transition by giving a clear signal that we will be making a clean break with everything that happened before I came to power and with all the problems that have been at the very root of the destruction of Congo. One of the first measures that I have taken was to close down all the jails and detention centers that were being used by the political police, uh, even though uh, officially they were the intelligence service, uh, from the former regime. And I had been told that these were actually jails that were legacies of the uh, colonial period. So I have closed down all these jails because for me, there is no longer an issue, there will be no longer any arbitrary arrests. I have also sanctioned all those who have been uh, complicit in uh, illegal activities up until now. Some of our uh, managers of public of our state-owned companies, some of our ministers for misconduct have been uh, have, have been punished for misconduct because the message I'm trying to send is very clear. I do not w wish to see any more corruption in our country, any sort of illegal activities, bad governance, and especially impunity, which, which encourages people to continue in these activities because Congo today, the DRC, is now standing up. And we are looking at our wounds of the past, trying to heal these wounds and to look to the future and to chase out these old demons of division, disorganization, and chaos. However, I do know that it is a country that has been destroyed for a long time by political systems that have really affected the, Cong the Congolese people, both our the men and women of Congo, a, a system that has delayed our development uh, and has delayed us with respect to our African neighbors. We actually have the capacity to be a regional leader and a leader of the continent. And therefore, we absolutely must attack this plague through very clear measures and, above all, through a new dialogue, breaking with the past. However, we cannot go about this through a systematic and brutal cleansing because the country has made great progress, as I've said. The system that we now have in place and that is being changed is a system that was put into place with the arrival of the FDLL and has uh, been in place for more than 20 years. And for 22 years, as you may well imagine, 
this regime has really taken root at the heart of the Republic and, and developed many tentacles. As we were able to have this peaceful transfer of power, unlike all the other changes of power we had, we've had in our country in the past, we, of course, will it will take some time to fully uh, throw off the shackles of this former regime. So I am here to uh, throw off the shackles of this dictatorial regime that was in place because our country, the Democratic Republic of Congo needs to enter the era of democracy in a new era that will help us move forward and we have great potential to do so. My visit here in Washington is a, a visit where I hope to call upon the United States to be a partner with us in this great undertaking and to and as for as long as possible for me as l uh, long as possible would be the best because without having serious support and a powerful support i believe that we will have even more difficulties getting out of the current situation given that the united states is a country that knows the democratic republic of congo very well and has been a partner even before colonization I think that the U.S. is the ideal partner to help us to uh, undertake this great adventure. The first challenge that I would ask our American partners to help us with and to help us attack is the challenge of peace and security. I'm sure you were well aware of the situation and you know fully that Congo is in the throes of waves of destabilization that have been brought about by various armed groups, local armed groups, but even uh, armed groups that are foreign in nature. And for several months, uh, based on reports uh, that have uh, been given to me by our military intelligence services, there is even an Islamic threat, Islamist threat, and we fear that with the defeat of ISIS in Syria and in Iraq, that these terrorist groups would then try to deploy to Africa, which is really a soft spot for security in the world right now, and also a formidable reserve of natural resources uh, that could be used to finance their terrorism activities. Therefore, uh, the DRC's uh, problem uh, or issues with peace and security in the DRC are no longer a problem that affects only the Congo. This is a problem that has become an international problem. And if we truly want to overcome this issue, it is now the time that we need to take action and to fully tackle the issue so that we can eradicate all terrorists and terrorist activities once and for all. It is still possible because they are still having difficulty fully taking uh, root in our country. So we can still tackle this, this problem. I would also like to ask our American partners in our efforts to to restore a government worthy of this name. Uh, after all these years of corruption and dictatorship, our government has destroyed our government. As you may imagine, as you may know, in the DRC, we don't even know how many Congolese citizens we have. In Congo today, we don't even have a national identification card. The only identification card that uh, serves as an ID card are the voter registration cards. But we know very well that those cannot be issued to minors. So we can take a guess that we have a population of about 80 million, but we can't be fully sure of this figure. We also 
do not have credible institutions that are effective and able to uh, collect revenues stemming from the productive activities in our country. And this is something that is a profitable arrangement for many people with bad intentions. And according to some experts, there, were, there are approximately 15 to $20 billion that uh, escape the public tre treasury every year. So this is 15 to $20 billion that could do a lot, a lot of good in the DRC, especially uh, in terms of uh, promoting the development of our population. Here again, the American experience, the effectiveness and the credibility of the United States and their institutions could be a useful model for us and could help us to overcome this situation. Once we have reorganized and restructured our government and we have implemented fully rule, uh, rule of law along with a more effective judicial system that is more credible, we will finally then be able to be an attractive place for investors. And here again, the United States uh, can be a partner, a significant partner, uh, and to help us with all that we are trying to accomplish in our country. I would like to first of all give you uh, some information about the country, some facts uh, underlining the fact that we have huge potential that could be of great interest to America in terms of the strategic minerals reserves. We have uranium. And you know what, you know how valuable uranium is and that it can be either a uh, good or bad source of uh, d depending on what types of hands it falls into. We also have cobalt, which is, of course, used to in, uh, the, in, in all sorts of technology, modern technology, uh, and for tomorrow's technology. We have nobium, we have Colton. And all these high-tech industries with new technology are in great dem or, uh, these minerals are in great demand for these technologies. We also have the uh, Inga Dam site, which uh, could produce between 45 and 50 megawatts if we once we were able to fully implement all phases of the project. We also have numerous other sites, more than 200 sites, where we could construct a smaller dams, micro dams, that could also produce an enormous amount of energy for the country and help us to give a new boost to our industrial activity. We also have solar energy and a great deal of sun. Uh, we know that the United States is also uh, on the leading edge in these new renewable technologies. And there again, the United States' uh, con uh, contribution could be s helpful. We have agriculture. The Congo has 80 million hectares of arable land. And about 10 to 15 percent only is being uh, developed at the, time, at the current time. But if we were to use better technology and use our land better, Congo is actually capable of feeding two billion humans. But of course, in order to achieve all this, we have to have peace, security, and stability in the country. This is why the United States could be an important partner for the DRC and support us in the reform of our army, uh, which has been which is a project underway, but it has been slow in coming simply because we don't always have the means or the resources 
or the resources weren't allocated to this reform and were uh, allocated elsewhere. But we do need to continue reforming our army to strengthen its capacities and especially make it a more professional corps so that it can actually undertake its primary mission, which is to defend our country rather than to uh, take, uh, take it out on the citizens. This is what I wanted to say in summary uh, concerning my vision for the country and my expectations or hopes in terms of our partnership with the United States. We're hoping to see a partnership that would be what I would call a strategic partnership. Because I believe that it is in the mutual interest of both countries and that it will be necessary to have this partnership for both countries. This partnership will be both beneficial for the United States of America and for the Democratic Republic of Congo. As I was saying previously during other uh, meetings I've had this week with other partners, the United States in today's world of competition and a competitive world and globalization, the United States needs to have a powerful partner at the heart of Africa. And the Democratic Republic of Congo has the right profile to be this partner. Ladies and gentlemen, before I take your questions, I would like to once again reiterate uh, my gratitude and my thanks to the organizi organizers of the event. And I would also like to thank each and every one of you for the interest that you have shown in my country and uh, for the interest you've shown in me. Thank you very much. Excellency, thank you very much for that uh, very strong and clear presentation. Allow me also to say that we are most honored to have you here with us today at the Council on Foreign Relations. To my colleagues in the audience, uh, we will proceed by my asking a couple of questions to His Excellency, and then we will proceed for the balance of the time to questions and answers from the audience. Your Excellency, let me begin with a couple of questions that I know are on the mind of everyone here. You talked about the historic election uh, that happened in the Democratic Republic of the Congo with the first ever peaceful transfer of power from one person to another as a result of the election uh, that brought you to office uh, on December 30th. As you well know, there are many in the Congo across the continent here in Washington who argue that Monsieur Martin Fayoulou in fact won more votes in the election and thus have at best strong concerns about the legitimacy of the election that brought you to the presidency. Can you speak directly to those critics about the nature of this past election and about uh, the nature of your uh, holding the office of the presidency now. Thank you. As you know, I was just talking to you about the government in my country, our administration, which is still not fully organized and And therefore, in this type of a situation, the cacophony that tends to, uh, tends to come about with this could be something that almost any political actor could take advantage of to advance any sort of political argument. 
Even the United States, which is a country that is much more organized than ours on the administrative level, have not uh, been spared these types of electoral disputes. You may recall the Al Gore and George Bush elections. Uh, where there were weeks and weeks of electoral disputes. And in Africa, we were, uh, we were wondering, well, how is this possible that the champions of democracy have all these types of problems as well in this phenomenon? So all this just to say that there are never per perfect elections. The second point I would like to say with respect to the elections is that an opportunity was provided to those who wanted to dispute the results and to show that their argue to prove that their arguments were true and that uh, he ha he was in fact the uh, winner and that his victory was stolen from him so he uh, appealed to the constitutional court and all uh, the world's press was there. The opportunity was given to show the entire before the entire world that his victory had been stolen from him. But uh, for your information, he never did this. Our lawyers were also there, and they uh, were able to prove that I was the victor. Now, with respect to his strategy, his electoral strategy, let's let's say a few words about that. Mr. Martin Fayoulou, Fayoulou since this is whom we're speaking of, was uh, certainly a political actor, but we have to also recognize that neither him nor his party really had a national dimension, unlike my party, the UDPS. Uh, therefore, it was only by rallying other political actors that he was able to gain this notoriety. And throughout his entire campaign, and here we're talking about November, the elections were held in December, so he only had one month uh, to gain all this not notoriety. And during the entire campaign, all he did was to tell his voters to not go out to the polls and not vote because the voting machines that were going to be used were not were not reliable, uh, that they had been manipulated. This is what he was saying, uh, that they'd been manipulated to, to uh, vote for the, the candidate who is basically representing Kabila. This is what he was saying over and over during his campaign. Whereas during my campaign, I based my campaign uh, on the fact that we needed to vote either with or without the voting machines, but that we had to make sure there were observers at all the polling stations and that we were able to uh, overcome any sort of attempts to uh, rig the, the, the vote. And just a week before the elections, uh, Mr. Fayoulou uh, changed his strategy and then finally uh, joined with our position. But just to give you a quick side note, before that, uh, before he was against the voting machines, but he was saying that we had been corrupted by Kabila because we had agreed to use the voting machines and agreed to a rigged election. But then he finally came around to our position and he, and so maybe you could have asked yourself, we, we wonder whether maybe he also had been corrupted by Kabila to change his position. Having said that, he changed his position. So in a country with, that is the size of the DRC, with all the difficulties we have with communication, you can't tell me that the voters in four days were able to get this information, mobilize, and uh, come out in greater numbers than the UDPS of voters and vote for Martin Fayulu. Uh, uh, of course, you're uh, not uh, from in, in the rest of the world, you don't necessarily know the DRC, but those who live in the DRC know that this is actually impossible. There's no way this could have happened. And the proof of this is that when I was declared the winner, the definitive winner, and even when I was declared the provisional winner, and then, find th and then after the definitive winner, 
there were uh, uh, scenes throughout the DRC where people were overjoyed. And then, uh, but for Mr. Fayulu, who claims to have gotten over 60% of the vote, we didn't see any demonstrations anywhere to protest the publication of the results, those who were supposedly in favor of him. What we did see, on the other hand, were acts of violence that were uh, produced sporadically throughout the country and attacks against some of our, co our citizens. And they were against people who were identified as coming from the same province that I come from. So these were basically acts of tribalism. And that these were, uh, tr they were trying to attribute these to me. That, and there were victims. Uh, many people had died as a result of these attacks. But yet he still didn't manage to mobilize the population uh, as he wanted to. So I think this is the proof that the arguments that he is advancing are false. And I can continue by saying that certain uh, religious organizations of civil society were being brandished. Uh, I, I won't cite the names, but I'm sure you can easily find them or you can easily imagine which ones I'm speaking of. These religious organizations uh, supposedly affirmed that they had uh, proof that the results of the elections were false, and this religious organization even went so far as to claim that they had accredited 44,000 uh, observers. This information uh, was uh, rather than having 44,000 observers. In reality, there were actually only 17,000 electoral observers that had been accredited by CENI, the Electoral Commission. And of these accredited observers, only about 5,000 were actually out in the field on the day of the elections, in other words, on December 30th, 2018. Uh, the other uh, issue that's raised is uh, why? Those who claim to have the truth have still not been able to fully back up this truth. And I remember, I recall that our observers, because we also took the time to organize two electoral centers, and I stress that too because there was an official one, a, a, no, a well known, and then another. Uh, uh, unofficial electoral uh, center that we kept it secret for strategic reasons. But the representatives of our electoral, our official electoral center went out to see the representatives of this religious organization to compare the results. But at no point in time were they convinced uh, that the, the candidate who was claiming victory actually had won. And yet, these are religious organizations, but there was not uni unanimity amongst these organizations. There were some religious organizations who disputed this, dec this proclamation and who contested what their colleagues were advancing and who were supporting the publication of the results by the Constitutional Court, which designated me as being the winner of the elections. Now, it's true, and I have no doubt, there were some imperfections with the elections, certainly. As I said, there, no election is ever perfect. However, I do not believe that my victory was obtained through fraud. Because anyone who knows the Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo and, and you, uh, 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 as I've been told, you are specialists and experts in international relations, you must also realize that what UDPS represents in our country and all the present, all the uh, demonstrations, even the most recent ones, have shown the popularity of our party. So to say today that UDPS, with its glorious past and the human sacrifices and political sacrifices that it has made 
to say that it rigged the elections is really something that is uh, uh, that uh, is something that uh, tarnishes the names of all of our martyrs and all of the people who have fought so hard for democracy and for the fight for democracy that we have carried out for over 30 years. So I strongly contest this argument as strong with uh, on the strongest terms of terms as possible. And I would still say that the person who is contesting these elections needs to bring proof because he cannot just hide behind argument X, Y. He has to actually bring proof to show that he really, truly did win the elections. Thank you. Excellent seat. There for questions. I will ask if you have a question, please raise your hand. One of my colleagues with a microphone will come to you. I ask that you ask a question, noting that a question ends in an interrogative. Uh, if you have any difficulty making your statement into a question, I will be more than happy to assist you in that regard. Uh, yes, Steve Morrison. Also, please state your name and affiliation. Um, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. I'm Steve Morrison from CSIS, Center for Strategic International Studies. My question is, has to do with the Ebola outbreak um, in the East. Um, as you know, uh, things are not going well. Uh, over 1,100 cases, uh, well over 600 fatalities, and the trajectories on all scores are, are, are very disturbing. Uh, security and active community mistrust and resistance are, are the biggest challenges. So my question to you is, what might you be doing that's new and different as opposed to your predecessor in bringing the power of your office to try to correct the situation and avoid a further expansion of this very dangerous outbreak. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. The Ebola outbreak is a concern, a great concern for our country. The only good news that we have until now is that we have been able to contain the disease. The region of Beni, for those who know, the Democratic Republic of Congo is uh, a, a road, uh, a great uh, that is close to Uganda, to the borders, and also uh, a corner where you can go to uh, back into the country. So it's really a good uh, area from where people can really extend and have a very uh, and have very great impact but thank God until now we have been able to contain the disease and, and contain uh, the, the outbreak of the disease the problem that we have today is to eradicate and attack the disease when I arrived at the end of January I did not delay to invite the Minister of Health in order to have a status on the situation, that he would report to me on the situation. And this allowed me to see that there were some issues, notably in the utilization of, of the knowledge, of the resources that we have, the underutilization of the resources. And among those, it's setting aside people who have a, a, a world who are known globally uh, for fighting against Ebola, people who have contributed uh, to, the, to the fight against uh, Ebola when it hit uh, South Africa, when it hit uh, Sierra Leone. One of them is Professor Muyembe, who was set aside who was never associated to, to this work. And so I started by starting a, a small cell agency that Professor Muyembe is leading so that he will be able to go on site and strengthen the um, capacities of those who are already working on site. But you must know that we are facing difficulties locally. The first one is insecurity. Twice already, uh, 
the center where the, the sick people are kept were attacked twice. So, of course, uh, the people who were sick had to scatter. And even some uh, of the of the medications have been taken away. And unfortunately, this is a consequence of the uncontrolled armed groups who are causing desolation in that region. The second difficulty is more cultural. Many of our uh, countrymen in that area, in that region, they think that it's a comp uh, it's a plot against them that this disease has been is an imaginary one or has been fabricated to come and kill their population. And those who think that this is a fake disease, that it doesn't really exi exist, and they are not hesitating to get in touch with the disease, of, with the sick people, or even to try and protect them while they try to run away uh, from the doctors, others try to protect them. And so that creates a tendency to make things worse. So we have problems at multiple levels, at the security level, at the cultural level, and even, again, at the scientific level, to be able to attack even the disease in order to eradicate it. And so that's why it will take time. And that's why I have uh, strengthened this uh, by adding a specialist that is globally known who can help us see together what we can do. In addition to that, I have another good news, is that I had welcomed um, the, the, the head of the CDC in Atlanta, who came to Kinshasa. He came to manifest his support to us, and who promised many good things. Uh, he has many good news. For, for the fight against this disease. So we believe that his input will also will be determining in order to strengthen the fight that we have already started. And like I said, uh, until now, uh, the disease has not broken out of the region of Beni, and we pray that it remains this way, even though, of course, we are very worried about uh, the sick people who run away after the second attack of the health center where they were um, admitted. So I hope and I believe that uh, it will not go further than this. In any case, we are determined to fight against this disease, and all our willingness and all of our expertise is uh, welcome to come and strengthen us in this fight. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. I'm Jay Kinsara with the Hindu American Foundation, and my question is, what steps are you taking to uh, prevent and combat foreign interference into the Democratic Republic of Congo in three areas? One is the debt trap that many of your neighbors find themselves in in China. Second is uh, the Islamic State, where they could, where their ideology could infect, you know, citizens of your country. And third is predatory NGOs who seek to exploit uh, conditions of your country for their own gains. For the first and the third, I believe, question, for the debt and, and talking about the mines, I believe I spoke about this a little bit when I spoke about the administration, the government, and good, good governance, and when I spoke about the fight against corruption. I believe that, in, of course, in order to solve these problems, we would need ourselves to be well organized as a state. And we are a state that is able to generate a lot of wealth so that we would be able to pay our debt 
and also to become more credible, to attract more investments. And that's why I believe the field that is before me, it's an immense field. I'm aware of this, and I believe that I'm, I might not even get to the end of this field myself in all of its uh, ex uh, how extended it is. But for me, the essential is to place the basis of a modern state, a state that is well managed and that benefits of its wealth to, by using it in the, the right way and to be able to distribute it in a way that it is impacting directly on the population and also increase the development. And so talking about, uh, about the Islamist uh, threat, I said earlier that it is indeed a, a permanent concern for us. I didn't know about it uh, before I came into office. And of course, this is at the level of uh, uh, military intelligence and even other uh, intelligence in order to have that kind of intelligence. Uh, when I was in the opposition, we were not aware privy to this information. So the first thing that I wanted to do and which I want to do, it is to get my uh, country as a member of the global coalition uh, with the fight against terrorism. We must all come together and share our intelligence and our experiences so that we'll be able to eradicate this. Um, so the example of the fight against Daesh has shown, um, ISIS has shown that we're all speaking the same language. If we do that, we will be able to eradicate this plague. On another hand, there is a fight against poverty. The Islamists are setting up exactly where there is a lot of poverty, where there is a lot of lack of uh, education, lack, lack of instruction. So we must also go towards those solutions to fight against poverty and mostly to educate our uh, people, the masses. And there, one of my priorities is to make education a requirement because, of course, where the Islamists are going to fetch people, it's the younger people. And, of course, uh, the, young, uh, the youth in the Congo currently is des uh, completely desperate and without any hope. And so what I want to do is during my office time is to make this a reason to hope for our youth by offering them, first of all, the chance to freely access education and in the future to be able to find uh, employment in a way decent employment that will allow them to recover their dignity and to prepare themselves to prepare to take over this country in the future. So this is a little bit of uh, the way that I am planning to face the problems that you might, you mentioned. Are there any ladies to whom I might give the floor who might have a question? No? Yes, sir, please. Good afternoon. Welcome, uh, Mr. President. I'm Vemba Dizolelo with the uh, International Republican Institute and uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Mr. President, your people in your country lost faith in the Electoral Commission, and this is why they continue to ask you these questions. In fact, the United States, which is ready to help, has sent mixed signal. They've accepted, they congratulate you for your victory, at the same time they punish members of the Electoral Commission, sanction them at the highest level, and also sanction members on the Constitutional Court. So that's a message that is at best mitigated. How quickly will you move to a, put a government that will restore the rule of law, and how quickly will you move to reform this Electoral Commission so that the country will start healing and getting a process that is credible and believable? Thank you very much. Ma 
merci, cher Mvemba. Thank you, dear Mvemba, and uh, and actually, thank you. Uh, I'm going to greet you. I'm glad to see you. I had not noticed you there. You're asking a very good question. It is true that the elections didn't go very well, like I said earlier. But indeed, and they shouldn't, and I keep talking uh, to my counterpart, in uh, American counterpart in Kinshasa and here, that this victory that is very fragile should not be destabilized again because we will not have different ways to stabilize the country. If we lose uh, this, of course, fragile, uh, weak balance, but if we don't keep it, we might fall again in chaos that we were fearing before elections. Now, since this chaos didn't happen, and that these elections uh, happened, you know, pretty OK, considering uh, in 2006, let me remind you, we were two wars, I'm saying wars, in Kinshasa, at the heart of Kinshasa, in the area where you know there are many embassies over there. Uh, and adding those two wars, we're counting more than a thousand deaths. No international sanctions were taken. No investigations were open. In 2011, and I know what I'm talking about because the UDPS uh, was in uh, the elect running in the elections. Our leader, who is now passed away, Etienne Chishekedi, was a candidate to the presidential elections. And we ourselves, we also said uh, that we th we declared that we had won those elections. And contrary to those who say today, we were able to demonstrate it on our time. And the country stayed in crisis for many months. And there were manifestations everywhere. And the leader even had to be put into uh, house uh, arrest in order to stop him from meeting his uh, constituents. Today, we are uh, authorizing everyone who is even uh, contesting the elections to have their meetings. That's just for the historical background. Now I come back to say, in 2011, there were deaths of, of uh, human uh, beings during the electoral process and even after. No sanctions. In the contrary. The international community has recognized those elections. Who, which, according to the Carter Foundation, was a, an, an electoral catastrophe in a way my words. And today, now that we've had uh, a peaceful elections, no death, not before, not during, and not after, with a change of power at the key level, while everybody was expecting the person in power uh, to rig things in order to put his own candidate. No, it is the candidate of the historical um, opposition that becomes a president. And still, you want to sanction those who organized these elections. I believe that is an error in strategy. I do not say that these people are saints, but and I explained to you that these elections, they were mishaps, but we have to recognize the merit of this saini is to be able to organize elections without major incidents as the ones we've known in 2011 and in 2006. I am the first one who is surprised, and I have the opportunity to say it frankly to all my American counterparts. And today I am not pleading impunity because I myself will sanction in the future. But I am pleading that people will accompany the Congo into stability. I'm not saying that the sanctions are useless, but I am wondering what are they for because the process has given an unexpected result that is positive, and that today the time is more into developing and moving forward instead of uh, blocking. 
So simply, this is what it is about. And it, and it, it pushes me to be very surprised why so many sanctions that are continuous while I'm actually talking about the CENI, you know, this is a team that will stop working in June. Their mandate is over. In June, they will leave. So if they were sanctioned uh, for, reason, for reasons of corruption, so we would sanction about the three-fourths of Congolese because corruption is endemic in the Congo. We would sanction almost everybody and talk about all the political class that has been there for about all these years. So if, so if it's a matter of denouncing that uh, the results of the CINI that was proclaimed that was not right, let's talk about the results and uh, don't say uh, on one side we are sanctioning your corruption, but on the other side we are recognizing the result of this uh, that the CINI has uh, published and uh, we recognizing the, the elected president. So, of course, there's a dichotomy here. It's a paradox that could uh, weaken our current um, um, balance that we are trying to make and that we absolutely do not need. As you know, the United States of America, as you can see how influent you can be, I've always said that it is because of the position of the United States of America that the post-electoral um, process has been saved. They were tentative to destabilize us that came from uh, Africa and of Europe. Uh, I will not go back into those events, but it's because the position of the United States was to uh, acknowledge the result and later on to say we support the result of the of the ballots that everything else uh, started to calm down so now having the united states coming back to their word uh, and their support removing their support from what themselves helped to make happen i find it pretty strange but i continue to believe that after I've uh, done all this trip, that today um, the opinion of the United States is much more positive than it used to be before I arrived here, and this is a good thing. A reputation of ending uh, precisely on time here at CFR, and the hour is indeed 5.30. So, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in thanking His Excellency, His Excellency, for the